Cheryl Savoy had the crowd jumping. The Vermilion was crowded. The bouncers weren't letting people in because they were at full capacity. The last thing Randy Paul wanted was for the fire chief to shut them down. Five women, employees of the public utilities of St. Anne Parish, entered and took a table. They weren't loud, noisy, or obnoxious, but they weren't quiet either. Didn't they have a band on Friday? One woman asked the others. Yeah, I think someone said they wanted too much money, agreed another woman. Soon they began to be invited to drink and dance. Drinks were not refused, and most offers to dance were accepted. We need to keep an eye on handbags, the fifth woman shouted to be heard over the music. But sit with me until someone comes back, okay? Peter Newland smiled and took the offered seat. While they were waiting for one of Deirdre Bremer's friends to return, Peter told Deirdre that he was an attorney, new to the law firm Banks, Chastain, and Green. While they were talking, he did not hide his thick wedding ring. Um, married? Deirdre asked pointedly, tapping the gold bracelet with a polished, blood-red fingernail. Mm-hmm. Peter smiled and pointed to an attractive blonde who was dancing on the dance floor with a handsome young man. Charlene is right there. When she said she was going to dance with him, I think he said his name was Danny. I said, I'm going to dance with you. Deirdre watched Charlene's flexible, sensual movements. Charlene's silk tank top revealed that Charlene was not wearing a bra. Charlene's short leather miniskirt sparkled against the lace cuffs of Charlene's black stockings as she danced with her male partner. Peter watched his wife as she moved her hips and buttocks sensuously. He looked at Deirdre and smiled when he saw that Deirdre's attention was focused on Charlene. Deirdre was attractive in a somewhat harsh way. Her blonde hair was thick, with many brown streaks, commonly referred to as a dirty blonde. Her hair was cut to shoulder length. There was a certain hardness in her brown eyes and her lips were pouting. Peter theorized that at some point in the past, someone had told Deirdre that she was beautiful, and Deirdre had believed them. The fact that the young man only said those words to have sex with a well-endowed girl had never crossed Deirdre's mind. Someone said she was beautiful, and Deirdre wanted to believe that she was beautiful. Peter felt that if he called Deirdre sweetheart, she would be very offended. After another song, two of Deirdre's colleagues returned, accompanied by two grinning young men. Peter and Deirdre walked onto the dance floor, joined the crowd of happy, sweaty people, and started dancing. Peter and Charlene were cut from the same cloth. Both moved with sensual grace. Deirdre smiled as Peter pulled her into a loose embrace. The light and pulsating bass blended with their movements. Drink? Peter suggested after the third song. Yes, Harvey Wallbanger, Deirdre pleaded. Charlene, love, this is Deirdre, Peter introduced Deirdre to his wife. I'll get us a drink, make sure no one steals it from us. Hello, Charlene said happily, and surprised Deirdre by kissing Deirdre on the lips. Peter returned a few moments later. Charlene nodded her thanks and took a sip. Deirdre swallowed half of her wallbanger in one gulp, and then resumed her conversation with Charlene. Deirdre works in the order cancellation department, Charlene told Peter. About? So you were the one who cut off my electricity? Peter looked at Deirdre mockingly. No. It was you who made the decision to spend your funds rather than pay the bill, Deirdre grinned. Deirdre informed Marcia, their designated driver, that she was leaving. Marcia took a sip of water and looked at Deirdre with a raised eyebrow. Looking past Deirdre, Marcia looked at Peter and Charlini, then shrugged. See you on Monday, Deirdre said enthusiastically and rushed off to catch up with Peter and Charlene. Peter opened the back door of his Mercedes for his wife and Deirdre. As he started the car, Charlene moved and sat closer to Deirdre. Before leaving the Vermilion parking lot, Charlene and Deirdre kissed, tongue teasingly. Deirdre didn't notice how many turns Peter made, didn't notice which direction they were going. At the club, it was obvious that Charlene wasn't wearing a bra. Her breasts swayed freely in the soft tank top. When the car died, Charlene and Deirdre separated. Deirdre looked around and noticed that they were in a very neat garage. The red lipstick Mazda Miata in the second garage bay made Deirdre squeal that she wanted one. Mm. 
That's my car. Charlene laughed at Deirdre's reaction. So why didn't you all ride it? Deirdre asked as Peter helped her out of the back seat. We knew we wanted to take one or two people home with us, Peter said as he opened the door leading from the garage to the kitchen of their home. It's hard to fit three or four people into her tiny matchbox. Huh, Deirdre said as Charlene pushed Deirdre into the small, comfortable bungalow. By the way, is this, uh, that Danny guy? Peter asked Charlene as he closed and locked the garage door. That lovely bulge in his pants, it was a rolled up sock, Charlene admitted. You, you're kidding me, oh my God. Peter rolled his eyes. God, do people still do this shit? Mm-hmm, I guess, agreed Charlene, dragging Deirdre into the living room. Honey, can you make us a couple drinks? Charlene picked up the remote control from the coffee table and pressed a button. Soft music started playing, and Charlene pulled Deirdre close to her. The two women hugged each other and swayed slowly to the music. Charlene kissed Deirdre and lightly sucked on her tongue. Peter and me, we, we are in an open relationship, Charlene admitted to Deirdre. There is nothing more erotic or more satisfying to me than watching my beautiful wife make love to another man, Peter admitted, placing a fresh Harvey Wallbanger and a grasshopper on two coasters on the coffee table. Or a woman, Charlene said. Or a woman, Peter agreed. Making love, Charlene croaked, clinking her glass with Deirdre's. Making love, Peter echoed, touching his glass to two glasses. Making love, Deirdre agreed, sipping her drink. After the workday came to an end, Deirdre rushed home, ate a frozen meal from the microwave, then pulled on a black lace bra and matching thong. She had a black camisole sewn underneath her black mesh blouse, so it looked like she was wearing nothing underneath, but there was little chance of anyone seeing any body parts. The smoky gray knee-length skirt and black stockings showed off her legs perfectly. In the bedroom, Charlene and Peter helped Deirdre undress. Oh, so beautiful, Deirdre, your breasts are just gorgeous, Charlene admired, leaning closer to her. On the huge bed, the trio wriggled into a garland. They took turns lighting each other's lamps, using all the conceivable and inconceivable capabilities of their bodies. Breathing heavily, the girls collapsed on both sides of the bed and sent the man to get drinks. Peter entered the bedroom and served Charlene and Deirdre fresh drinks. He nearly dropped Deirdre's glass when there was a sudden sharp knock on the front door. So who the hell? Peter asked, pulling on his robe. Deirdre's eyes widened as Peter grabbed a nine millimeter pistol from a drawer, the same drawer the anal lube had been taken from. A second loud knock was heard. Peter shouted that he was on his way. Wait. When Peter looked through the peephole, no one was visible. Without removing the safety chain, Peter opened the door. Hello, mister. Is my mom here? Peter heard a squeaky voice. Hmm. Peter asked, trying to peer into the darkness. Mister, is my mother here? The voice squeaked it again. Peter looked down and saw a little girl wearing Barbie pajamas, the kind of pajamas with socks. She looked at him, his small face smiling. Hmm, Peter asked again. Mom, is my mom here? My dad says this is where mom and I will live, the little girl said, her words stumbling and tripping over each other. Now Peter saw that there were three suitcases directly behind the little girl. He saw no one else, only the little girl and the suitcases on his porch. Peter closed the door and removed the safety chain. He opened the door and went out onto the porch. He looked around, then turned around as a little girl ran into his house. I, hey, uh, uh, you, go away, don't run into my house, Peter turned and shouted after the little girl. Two squeals told Peter that the child had found the bedroom and burst into Charlene and their guest. Still not seeing anyone outside, Peter entered the house again and locked the front door. Deirdre, I don't care, Peter heard his wife bark angrily. Peter heard sobs coming from the bedroom and rolled his eyes. Lustful women, nasty women, drunk women. These are all the types he could deal with. Crying women were beyond his skill set. Entering the bedroom, Peter saw his wife in her usual robe with the sign, I don't want to talk about it. 
Deirdre dressed awkwardly as the little girl sat on the edge of the bed. As he entered the room, Charlene turned and glared at Peter. It's your problem, deal with it, Charlene growled and stormed out of the room. My, my, my husband, my husband, Deirdre hiccuped as she tried to speak. That's none of my concern, Peter interrupted Deirdre's sentence. Honey, you knew you were married when I asked you to dance. You knew you were married when you got into our car. You knew you were married when you walked into our bedroom. So that's your problem. But, but, but he, he's divorcing me, Deirdre howled. Don't cry, Mommy, everything will be fine. The little girl tried to reassure her mother. So, um, I, I, so where do you want me to drop you off? Peter asked, pulling on his sweatpants. You are listening to me? Deirdre screamed at Peter. No, not really, Peter admitted. Again, Deirdre, you knew you were married when you volunteered to come with us. Gabrielle thought that staying at the Degard Hotel had been a wonderful experience. Deirdre tried to put on a happy face for the four-year-old's sake. Once Gabrielle had finally gone to bed and fallen asleep on the large bed, Deirdre opened the large envelope that Michael had taped to the outside of the largest suitcase. As Deirdre read, the tears began in earnest. Michael apparently took a DNA test on their daughter and learned that Gabrielle was not his. If Deirdre decides to contest the terms of the divorce, Deirdre's father and mother will learn that Chad Dumela, Deirdre's half-brother, was in fact the father. After Chad's death, Deirdre's mother fell into a deep depression. The news that her dead son and her daughter, Chad's half-sister, are having sex could be the final nail in Debbie Dumela's coffin. This was the first blow, an attempt to pass off your brother's child as mine, Michael wrote. The second strike was leaving the nightclub and getting into the car of Peter and Charlene Newland. Whatever happened next, Deirdre's intentions were crystal clear when she separated from her colleagues and left the nightclub with two strangers. This is not baseball, this is real life, Michael wrote in a short economical hand. You won't get strike three. The terms of the divorce were actually quite reasonable. Deirdre would receive alimony of $500 a month for 42 months, the same number of months they had been married. Gabrielle, however will receive $800 a month until she turns 18. Since the courts would not care that Michael was not the father of a minor child, since he would have a duty to provide for the child, Michael requested visitation with his daughter. In his own words, it was wrong to harm Gabrielle because of her mother's sins. Deirdre cried as she put down the pages. The words were too blurry to continue reading. The music, the light, the taste of alcohol, the smell of cologne, perfume, and sweat. Everything conspired to seduce her. But Deirdre knew that she had willingly allowed herself to be seduced. Sunshine, coffee, two sticky donuts, and apple juice for Gabrielle really brightened her mood for the day. Michael answered the phone after the second ring and agreed that Deirdre could come pick up her car. Michael, I know, I know, I'm just saying that I... Deirdre began, but the phone beeped, telling her that Michael had disconnected. Back in the room, Deirdre signed the papers and called an Uber. Gabrielle still thought it was a grand adventure and was looking forward to their trip. The keys are on the front wheel, Michael wrote. We'll put the signed papers in the mailbox, Deirdre replied. Financial institution Great Oak Savings and Loan hired Deirdre Dumela, and she fit in well. Gabrielle Bremer loved her new school, she was already a big girl and was now going to kindergarten. She made friends easily at school and at the trailer park where she and her mother lived. Every other Friday, he and Mom would go to Lake Charles to Cracker Barrel and have dinner with Dad, and then he and Dad would go to Dad's house for the whole weekend, and then on Sunday, they would have dinner again at Cracker Barrel, and he and Mom would go home. To your trailer. I know I've said this a thousand times, Deirdre said after lunch on those Sundays, but it's true. I'm just really sorry. There is no third strike, Michael said categorically. Bye, honey. Bye, bye. Dad already misses you. Be a good girl for your mom, okay? Nearly a year after Deirdre Gabrielle's indiscretion dashed her hopes of a possible reunion, at Sunday dinner, Gabrielle talked nonstop about the upcoming wedding, 
She had already chosen a dress for the flower girl, and Miss Irma was very sweet and said that Gabrielle would be the most beautiful flower girl in the world, and... Through a haze of tears, Deirdre saw the expression of sympathy on Michael's face. He did not gloat or mock. He really knew how Deirdre felt. That's how you felt when... when I got into that car? Deirdre whispered as Gabrielle paused in her monologue long enough to scoop some ketchup on her fries. Michael didn't answer. Deidre tried her best not to burst into tears as he carefully reached across the table and squeezed her hand. Thursday of the following week was the 15th of the month. All the cashiers and customer service staff knew it was payday for a large portion of Oakleaf County. As expected, there was a bit of jogging during lunch and then another jog towards the end of the day. Deirdre smiled as Glenn Kennedy, a handsome older man, allowed a young woman to walk ahead of him when Penny called out her availability. Deirdre ended her conversation with the young man at her window and waved Glenn forward. Glenn Kennedy was handsome, very well-dressed, and had a deep, rich voice that made Deirdre go weak in the knees. In the past, she had politely rejected his attentions, hoping against hope that Michael would forgive her. But now that Michael has moved on, Hey, beautiful, ready to run away to Mexico with me? Glenn asked, presenting the commission check and deposit receipt. Why don't we go on a couple of dates first? I wouldn't want to come all the way to Mexico and find out that I don't like the way you snore, Deirdre suggested. I, are you serious? Uh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, Glenn stammered, pleased that his favorite bank teller was finally starting to go easy on him. On their date, a fun evening at Japanese hibachi restaurant Tokyo Gardens, followed by an ice cream sundae at Holland's Hand Cranked, ice cream shop, Deirdre held nothing back. She admitted that she was a bit slutty in high school and only went to college for a year before pregnancy forced her to drop out and find gainful employment. She spoke openly and honestly about why her loving and devoted husband filed for divorce. In the spirit of openness, Glenn spoke about his 14-year marriage to his high school sweetheart. A few days before their 15th anniversary, two months before Gloria's 34th birthday, Gloria decided to leave the relationship. Deirdre was impressed by Glenn's maturity towards his ex-wife. Her deception clearly hurt him, but he did not call his ex-wife derogatory names. When he spoke, he did not use profanity. But you know, it really made sense why she never wanted children. Glenn smiled sadly and then brightened. But tell me about Madame Gabrielle. She goes to kindergarten, right? Their second date was bully burgers and then ice skating. Deirdre learned that she could ice skate, and happily told Glenn that she couldn't wait to take Gabrielle to the skating rink. She was confident that her little girl would become a professional figure skater in no time. This date ended in bed in Deirdre's trailer. Lauren Kennedy taught Glenn well, and Deirdre silently thanked the unknown woman. A month after their first date, Glenn accompanied Deirdre and Gabrielle to Friday dinner with Michael and Miss Irma. The men immediately became close, talking about the lack of decent coaching staff at the local university level. Irma had that unmistakable glow, and Deirdre shared memories of her pregnancy with Gabrielle. No, no, unless you're in the Big Ten or the SEC. Forget about the coach, Michael agreed. A large tablespoon of honey with prune juice, advised Deirdre. Oh, and watch your sugar. I mean processed sugar. Trust me, I know how much you want tornado donuts. Do not do that. Do not do that. I have a meeting with Craig Goodwin tomorrow morning, Glenn said casually, as he drove west on I-10, while Michael, Irma, and Gabrielle drove east. About? Is he not going to buy that Ferrari? Deirdre joked by naming the shiny black Ferrari she kept begging Glenn to buy for her. Hmm? No, no, he's going to sell me the house, Glenn smiled. What? Deirdre asked. Yeah, I think it's time for me to move out of this matchbox apartment, Glenn said, slowing down to let the truck pass. And it's time to get you and Gabrielle out of that trailer you're all in. What to do? Deirdre asked. So, you need to come with me to help choose our house, Glenn said. Since they were to meet Craig Goodwin in the morning, Deirdre stayed overnight in Glenn's small apartment. Their first sex was just quick and dirty. Their second connection was slow and loving. I, I love you, Deirdre said, 
feeling safe and warm in Glenn's arms. Finally, Glenn whispered triumphantly into Deirdre's ear. I finally got you to say it. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.